to introduce to you Professor Catherine Wilson. She's an assistant professor at Villanova University in the Department of Political Science. She took her undergraduate degree in philosophy and Latin American studies at Villanova University, then a master's degree at Georgetown University in Latin American studies, culminated her studies after studying abroad in Latin America, as well as working in the financial sector for a while at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia under the auspices of John DeLulio, her supervisor and that was in the political science department. She is the author of a New York University press book, The Politics of Latino Faith, Religion, Identity, and Urban Community, which was the first systematic treatment of Latino faith-based organizations in the United States. Professor Wilson's current research, which we're going to learn more about today, examines the role that public, private, and nonprofit organizations are playing in serving immigrant communities in the city of Philadelphia with specific attention paid to immigrant integration. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society at the University of Pennsylvania, and has been a fellow of the James Madison Program for American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. It was through this program at Princeton that uh, I had the pleasure of first getting to know Professor Wilson. Professor Wilson is a community stakeholder for the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and the Nationality Service Center, a nonprofit refugee resettlement agency in Philadelphia, and is also part of the leadership collective for the community and grassroots section for the Association for Research on Nonprofit Organizations and Voluntary Action. She frequently responds to media inquiries on immigration politics and social movements, as well as religion, including on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the uh, Mitt Romney campaign, etc. Uh, one of her most recent interviews is going to be appearing in Newsweek, but she's also commented for the Christian Science Monitor, the Pittsburgh Tribune, Tribune Review, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Welcome, Professor Wilson. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege for me to speak to you today. I would first like to thank the Wheatley Institution here at Brigham Young University and especially Dr. Richard Williams for invi inviting me to speak on a topic of personal, communal, national, and global interest. I want to thank the institution for its generous hospitality that it's displayed during my visit here and want to praise its academic mission in seeking creative and powerful ideas which lead toward practical and constructive solutions to real societal issues. There is nothing more noteworthy than seeking out new ideas and reclaiming old ones in an attempt to solve the greatest societal challenges that we face today. I also want to thank Dr. Paul Carey, a Wheatley Institution Fellow and Professor of History here at BYU, for his continued interest in my scholarship and for his genuine and collegial friendship. Finally, when I want to thank all of you in attendance for this lecture. I hope that I can present the topic in a way that sparks renewed interest in the intersection among immigration, citizenship, and American political culture. And let me stop here just briefly to say that this work is an outgrowth of uh, the research that I conducted on Latino faith-based organizations. So after my original research doing ethnographic work in three different uh, urban neighborhoods in the United States, the issue of immigration loomed very large. So um, this is sort of a follow-through from that research. Furthermore, I hope to take the time to respond to your questions regarding this topic. So that, that being said, I intend to lecture for about 40 minutes and leave the rest of the time for questions and answers. A June 2011 Rasmussen poll reported that 57% of Americans preferred to be called good citizens as opposed to good patriots. Only 27% of those polled favored the use of the term good patriot over that of good citizen while a minority of Americans, 36%, considered the terms good citizen and good patriot interchangeable, 41% of Americans disagreed. That same month, Americans were polled about their views on immigration. A strong majority, 64%, identified border control as the top U.S. immigration policy. Granted, 
This is a common finding that is well documented in the mainstream press, that Americans want the border to be secured before any kind of immigration reform. Less reported, however, is the concurrent finding that Americans welcome a favoring um, and welcoming immigration policy, which apart from its emphasis on the prevention of national security threats, advances the flourishing of immigrants and immigrant communities in the United States. Indeed, a January 2012 Rasmussen poll indicated that a clear majority of Americans, 58% to be exact, support such a welcoming policy in the United States. There are several questions that arise from this polling data. First, are the positions that Americans largely favor border security along with a welcoming immigration policy reconcilable? An initial response would suggest that these polling results drive home the age-old belief by Americans that the United States is both a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. This rhetoric has been pronounced time and again in a bipartisan fashion. President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama equally have emphasized that America is indeed a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. But what does this exactly mean? And are these two characteristics of American political identity compatible? Second, should we view the notions of citizenship and immigration in American public life as interconnected or as separate items for analysis and discussion? What would scholars and practitioners in the field those working in the public and nonprofit capacity on behalf of immigrant populations have to say about this. Third, what are we to make of the fact that most Americans prefer to be called good citizens as opposed to good patriots? Is the American preference for the label of good citizen informed by larger trends of global citizenship? Or has the label citizen always been forefront in the minds of Americans, historically speaking? The primary objective of this lecture is to underline that the themes of immigration, citizenship, and American political culture are deeply intertwined. Immigrants at every stage of American history have continued to replenish the meaning of American citizenship from colonial times to present day America. Waves of new immigrants from every corner of the world also have contributed to building a thriving and robust American political culture by their ongoing concern for political, economic, and religious freedom and their belief in representative political institutions. And so American political culture is never far removed from the immigrant communities that continue to shape it. Indeed, it is the promised ideals of such a culture that oftentimes are the primary reason why immigrants leave their native lands to reach American shores. Before making their citizenship permanent, immigrants engage in a lengthy learning process about the importance of the American political narrative, studying American historical figures, political institutions, and indeed its political culture during the naturalization process. Not only are candidates for naturalization tested on the fundamentals of the American political system, but they are also required to verbally pronounce their attachment to the U.S. Constitution in the oath of naturalization. Oh, sorry. So this slide gives some sample questions asked during the naturalization process. Uh, just as an aside, you can see how you would score on a naturalization self-test by visiting the United States Immigration and Citizenship Services website. So these are some of the questions. There's um, actually a list of 100 questions that um, immigrants who are candidates for naturalization study. And of those questions, they have to respond to 10 during the naturalization test. And of those 10, they have to get six correct. Apart from required courses, and American history courses in middle school and high school, native-born Americans are not expected to engage in this lengthy learning process about the American political system to prove their attachment to the United States Constitution, thereby validating their citizenship. And yet, alongside their immigrant counterparts, native-born Americans should not abandon wholesale a deeper examination of the journey of American citizenship. Surely, this journey entails becoming better acquainted with American political ideals and institutions. However, the journey also involves learning more about the multiplicity of immigrant traditions and customs in Americans' midst. Always conversing in two-way dialogue with immigrants, native-born Americans should be attentive to preserving both the country's cherished political ideals and its ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity. It is both of these features, the respect for political ideals and ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity 
which have identified the markings of American political culture from its earliest beginnings, albeit in differing degrees, depending on the geographic region in question. This lecture has five separate but interrelated parts. First, it will provide a brief look at the geographic landscape of immigration in the United States. Second, it will delve into historical discussions as to what citizenship has meant to prominent writers during America's colonial period. Third, it will discuss recent immigration legislation and the variety of ways states and municipalities have advanced either immigration reform or immigration control measures. Fourth, the lecture will outline the lively debates that took place during the Constitutional Convention regarding citizenship qualifications for high political office and their relevance to the larger discussion regarding rights of the foreign born. Fifth, it will discuss how constitutional ambiguity over immigration matters has contributed to present day struggles over the question of which level of government properly occupies the field of immigration. In so doing, it will make speculations as to how the twin forces of immigration and citizenship will continue to shape the future of American political culture for time to come. The International Organization for Migration estimated that the number of global migrants in 2010 was 214 million. Given that the global population numbered 6.9 billion that year, migrants accounted for approximately 3% of the total population in 2010. While 3% of the global population sounds rather insignificant, taken together, global migrants would constitute the fifth largest country in the world. Despite the regions of Europe and Asia accounting for over 60% of the global share of immigrants, the United States continued to be the largest immigrant receiving country in the world, receiving 20% of the overall number of migrants in 2010. The next largest receiving countries that year were the Russian Federation with 5.7%, Germany with 5%, and Saudi Arabia and Canada, each with 3.5%. The United States receives an even larger share of refugees. As reported by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the United States is the top refugee resettlement destination, receiving 74% of the total share of global refugees. The countries receiving the next largest refugee populations are Canada with 9.2% and Australia with 7.7% of the total share. Dimitrios Papadimitriou, president of the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., claims that migration is driven by a number of factors, human rights violations, the experience of economic, ethnic, religious, and linguistic discrimination, and the degree to which a tradition of migration exists between sending and receiving societies. All of these factors are important to keep in mind when considering migration flows, both legal and unauthorized, to the United States. During 2005, roughly 4.6 million people immigrated to the United States. Unlike previous decades, whereby immigrants to the United States settled in the big five states, California, New York, Texas, Florida, and Illinois, 2005 marked a year in which second-tier states, like New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Maryland, were receiving larger numbers of migrants, 12% to be exact. Also, states like Colorado, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Utah were becoming new destinations for immigrants. Whereas these states once held a 3.2% share of immigrants in 1980, 25 years later, that share grew to 7.5%. This last point confirms that a growing geographic diversification is accompanying new immigrant flows to the United States, including unauthorized immigrants, a population that numbered 11 million persons in 2010 after experiencing a peak of 12 million persons in 2007. In 2010, unauthorized immigrants registered 3.7% of the total population, 5.2% of the American workforce, and 28% of the foreign-born population in the United States, totaling 29 million legal immigrants who include naturalized citizens, legal permanent residents, and legal temporary migrants still accounted for 72% or the largest share of the foreign-born population in the United States in 2010. No longer are immigrants as a whole predictably settling in the big five states and in metropolitan areas. Instead, immigrants are bypassing these areas for new destinations, including new suburban gateways. 
Given these new demographic trends, some are talking about the rise of a suburban immigrant nation or a melting pot suburbs throughout the United States marked by rapidly diversifying suburban landscapes. Immigrant decisions to make the suburbs their home instead of former metropolitan regions mirror the same reasons Americans as a whole move to the suburbs, standard of living, job opportunities, schooling options, affordable housing, and personal mobility. Thus, given the geographic dispersion of immigrants throughout the country, the issue of immigration is no longer an issue confined to California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. It is an issue that affects every state, suburb, and mun municipality. And from a public administration perspective, it is an issue that every state and local government must now address. For example, what we see on the slide from the Brookings Institution is that in 2010, the metropolitan areas that experienced the greatest percentage increase in their immigrant populations, between 84 to 140 percent, were not Miami, Los Angeles, and New York City, but areas that were non-traditional immigrant gateways, such as the regions of Little Rock, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, Little Rock, Arkansas, pardon me, Jackson, Mississippi, and Birmingham, Alabama. And this is um, identified by the very dark blue spots on the map. Before the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868, Naturalization and the definition of American citizenship itself was an issue left to the states. John Adams remarked that this patchwork decentralization was precisely what the American citizen, citizenry wanted and it had in fact demanded. There was historic precedent for this. In the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, little uniformity existed concerning what American citizenship meant. Under the Articles of Confederation, a diversity of naturalization policies existed of which the convention delegates were aware. For instance, Article 4 allowed each state to control immigration as well as to craft its own naturalization laws. This same article allowed for the free movement of citizens from state to state. Citizens of one state were automatically citizens in every state. Clearly, this diversity stemmed from the variety of immigration models present during America's colonial era. In A Nation of Immigrants, Susan Martin of Georgetown University prevents, presents three such colonial models, Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. She argues that while economic considerations primarily drove immigration patterns for the Virginia model, Puritan religious and cultural assimilation was at the heart of the Massachusetts immigration model. Characterized by ethnic and religious pluralism, the Pennsylvania model placed great emphasis on liberty of conscience due to the strong belief in religious tolerance held by the colony's founder and Quaker, William Penn. Apart from establishing a uniform rule of naturalization and defining citizenship qualifications for high political office, the U.S. Constitution pays little regard to defining American citizenship in any specific sense. As Douglas Bradburn maintains in the Citizenship Revolution, Nowhere does the U.S. Constitution define who or what a citizen might be. Nowhere does it explicitly assign the privileges and duties of a citizen. Nowhere does it clearly delineate the relationship of state citizenship to national citizenship. Nowhere does it clarify who should settle fights between the states and the nation. A new legal definition of citizenship arrived with the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868 under the Citizenship Clause stating that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside, this clause articulates a conception of citizenship based on jus soli, right of birthplace, and jus sanguinis, right of blood, making United States citizenship primary and state citizenship derivative. Writing in 1782 from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, J. Hector's son, John de Crevecourt, a native Frenchman, naturalized American citizen, and farmer, provides a more detailed account of American citizenship from his letters from an American farmer. In this book, Crevecourt colorfully depicts the journey of one immigrant, whom he calls Honest Andrew, to the port of Philadelphia. Crevecourt's purpose in following Andrew through the province of Philadelphia is to provide an anecdotal sketch 
of what Crevcourt calls the progressive steps of an immigrant from poverty and oppression to a life of comfort and civic duty. Andrew is introduced to the readers as both a poor European and a simple Scotchman when he disembarks upon American shores. Acknowledging his character as his most formidable asset, Andrew does not have unrealistic expectations for wealth and professional success in this new land. Shortly after his arrival, however, Andrew obtains not only gainful employment, but also a new outlook on life. Like others who have traveled to the new world before him, he becomes a landowner. But more importantly, he becomes a citizen of the province of Pennsylvania, performing, as Crevcourt puts it, all of the duties required of him. The central question that arises from this anecdotal sketch of Andrew is whether it is an embellished account of the journey of American citizenship. After all, 18th century travel narratives are considered by many to be the forerunners of American fiction. Indeed, Crevcourt presents the character of Andrew in comical but endearing terms as he learns the rope of what such citizenship entails in three separate episodes. First, in displaying the difficulties Andrew has in saddling a horse. Second, in Andrew's fearful misreading of Native American fur traders. And third, in the excitement Andrew has after the construction of his new house. Taken together, these episodes reveal the variety of ways immigrants become integrated into American political life through their understanding of American customs and traditions, in their interactions with native-born Americans, and finally in their experience of the rewards of hard work and labor. After viewing the completion of his new home, Andrew's excitement was so overwhelming that he spent the whole day in smiling, laughing, and uttering monosyllables, says Crevcourt. He remarks that Andrew's wife and son were there also, but as they could not understand the language, their pleasure must have been altogether that of the imagination. In the end, honest Andrew's journey from the simple Scotchman to the fully vested American citizen was one characterized by gratitude, happiness, and civic participation, as displayed by his public service as juror, road overseer, and voting member of society. 100 years earlier, William Penn provides an equally enticing account of the province of Pennsylvania. Detailing the human progress that has been made, Penn spends considerable time documenting the natural resources found both in land and sea, including mighty whales rolling upon the coast, sturgeon that play continually in our rivers in summer, and grapes, mulberries, and many wild fruits and natural plums in abundance. Penn's portrait of the province is one of fruitfulness and boundless opportunities for trade and commerce, which he intentionally advertises to those Europeans who would consider themselves adventurers. And yet he counseled these adventurers to be modest in expectation, for such persons will best endure difficulties in this new land. Benjamin Franklin urges the same caution to those deliberating immigration to the United States. While it is true that land is cheap and abundant, the climate is agreeable, and the demand for useful and skilled workers is great in America. Franklin advises potential travelers to examine their expectations and determine whether they are real or imagined. It is genuinely expected that the laws will protect these new inhabitants and that through industriousness they will reap material rewards, says Franklin. And yet, unlike Europe, where there are the great masses of poor and few rich, Franklin finds that in America, only a general happy mediocrity prevails. So why would people come to this new land if only to have their expectations unmet or unsatisfied? Why would they come only to experience a happy mediocrity? Crevcourt suggests two central reasons, the laws and industry. He writes that the laws protect them as they arrive, stamping on them the symbol of adoption. On the other hand, through industry, they receive ample reward for their labors, and these accumulated rewards procure them lands, and those lands confer on them the title of free men. In a word, the journey to the new world and the concomitant journey of American citizenship are entirely about freedom. The journey is, as Crevcourt suggests, about becoming an American, a new man who acts upon new principles and entertains new ideas and forms new opinions. Because the American is nothing more than the mixture of English, Scottish, Irish, French, Dutch, Germans, and Swedes, 
Krev Kaur maintains that it is in America where individuals of all nations are melted into a new race of men whose labors and posterity will one day cause great changes in the world. Note the use of the word melted in this passage. It is here in Krev Kaur's writings where we find the first reference of the term the melting pot, now a deeply rooted and deeply contested feature of the American political imagination. This passage is noteworthy since Krev Kaur himself is an immigrant speaking on behalf of new Americans. Granted, Americans are a diverse bunch of people. This is why Krev Kaur can say with confidence that in America, we know, properly speaking, no strangers. This is every person's country. He continues, there is room for everybody in America. And yet, as the recent spate of state and local immigration legislation displays, there is not room for everybody in America. As reported by the National Conference of State Legislatures, 197 new laws and 109 new resolutions relating to immigration were introduced and enacted at the state level in 2011. While the majority of these new laws and resolutions were immigration control measures relating to law enforcement, identification, and employment initiatives, these laws and resolutions also included measures that were more welcoming to immigrant presence, such as increased funding for refugee resettlement programs, assistance for migrant health programs, and public ceremonies honoring immigrant contributions. So on the one hand, as several states like Alabama, Georgia, Indiana, and South Carolina followed the model of Arizona's controversial Immigration Control and Enforcement Initiative, SB 1070, other states passed versions of the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors, the DREAM Act, that same year, permitting in-state tuition for undocumented college students. In fact, at the end of 2011, there were officially five states, including Arizona, that enacted restrictive policies on immigration. But by the end of that same year, 13 states had passed versions of the DREAM Act. Meanwhile, Utah was the first state to enact comprehensive immigration legislation favoring both immigration enforcement policies and a legal immigrant workforce. Along with Alabama, Georgia, Indiana, and South Carolina, which have set forth more restrictive immigration policies, Utah's legislation also is being challenged in the courts. The Utah Compact, a set of immigration principles developed with the support of business, faith-based, nonprofit, and law enforcement communities, influenced the comprehensive nature of Utah's legislation. Signed in November 2010, the compact comprises five central tenets. One, immigration policy should involve federal solutions. Two, law enforcement entities should be focused on criminal violations, not civil ones. Three, policies should always be informed by the strong interest of keeping families together. Four, immigrants make significant economic contributions to the state, which should be recognized. And five, the state should at all times advance welcoming attitudes towards immigrants and encourage immigrant integration. Inspired by the guiding principles of the Utah Compact, members of the faith-based advocacy and legal communities, along with the support from Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter, drafted the Pennsylvania Compact in 2011. The main objective of this document was to move the immigration debate towards a more moderate and civil discussion. The tenets of the Pennsylvania Compact are almost identical to that of its Utah counterpart, with the exception of the fifth and last tenet, entitled a free and welcoming society. Guided by the language in the Utah Compact, the Pennsylvania version is tailored to the particular history of the city of Philadelphia, the site of the founding of the United States, as well as the history of the spirit of inclusion advanced by the colony's founder, William Penn. The last tenet concludes with a line, quote, the way that we treat newcomers sends a message about our state to the rest of the world, end quote. Never endorsed by the Pennsylvania State Legislature, the Pennsylvania Compact was adopted by Philadelphia City Council in 2011. A non-binding resolution, this compact resent, represents a symbolic gesture on the part of City Council to showcase its continued support for comprehensive immigration reform in the city of brotherly love. In addition to the patchwork of immigration ad legislation advanced at the state level, which John Adams predicted, Municipalities also have enacted their fair share of differing immigration initiatives and ordinances. The municipalities of Hazleton and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania are case in point. 
In 2006, Hazleton became one of the first cities in the United States to adopt restrictive policies towards immigrants. From 2000 to 2009, the city of Hazleton experienced a rapid increase in its foreign-born population. Whereas in 2000, 5.6% of the Hazleton residents were foreign-born, that number jumped to 24% of the total population of 22,000 residents in 2009. Supporters of the immigration control measure in Hazleton argued that this population increase was responsible for the rising crime rates, out-of-work residents, and fiscal strain on the municipal budgets. To deter unauthorized workers from residing in Hazleton, the City Council passed the Illegal Immigration Relief Act Ordinance of 2006, which made it unlawful for businesses to recruit, hire, or continue to employ these workers. Additionally, the ordinance made it unlawful to rent or lease space to unauthorized immigrants residing in Hazleton. In 2010, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the ordinance was unconstitutional. As of June 2011, the U.S. Supreme Court asked the appeals court to review the case. Two months later, the appeals court ruled to uphold the ordinance. Unlike Hazleton, the city of Philadelphia has taken a more welcoming approach to the issue of immigration at the municipal level. Philadelphia not only has a much larger population, 1.5 million persons as of 2010, but the city also has a longer history incorporating immigrant populations than its northwestern municipal neighbor. Furthermore, reports have documented the economic benefits of immigrant presence in Philadelphia. A 2008 Brookings Institution report found that 75% of the city's labor force growth since 2000 was attributable to immigrants. In addition, the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians, a nonprofit organization, has indicated that over 50% of the businesses in the city's bustling corridors are owned and operated by immigrants. Philadelphia also has a more developed infrastructure of nonprofit organizations that actively partner with city agencies on a range of immigrant initiatives. Indeed, some of its long-standing immigrant nonprofit organizations, like the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, or HIAS, are over 120 years old. Given the diversity of immigrant populations in the region, Mayor Michael Nutter resolved in a 2008 executive order that the city would deliver language access services to all residents with the hope that Philadelphia be a place of welcoming to all including newcomers looking to live and work in the city. As one of only eight municipalities in the nation charged with a language access policy, Philadelphia is considered an exemplar for the rest of the nation in its concern for tailoring public services to the needs of immigrants. The other seven cities with similar language access policies, New York City, Minneapolis, Seattle, Monterey, California, Washington, D.C., Oakland, California, and San Francisco have issued these policies by executive order, resolution, or local law. Broadly speaking, the city of Philadelphia has taken seriously the need to provide culturally competent services for its immigrant populations, institutionalizing its deep-seated belief in immigrant integration at every level of municipal government. As the cases of Philadelphia and Hazleton, Pennsylvania suggest, Crafting immigration initiatives at the municipal level is by no means a uniform task. Local governments are divided as to whether integrating immigrants or attempting to control flows of new immigrant populations is the best approach. Political deliberations over these matters are complicated, controversial, and subject to popular scrutiny. The same lack of uniformity was present among delegates at the Constitutional Convention as they vigorously debated citizenship qualifications for high political office. In response to the motion made by Pennsylvania Delegate Governor Morris to increase the years of citizenship for senators from four years to 14 for fear of foreign attachments, James Wilson, along with Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, Oliver Ellsworth, and Edmund Randolph objected, judging that the four-year residency requirement was both adequate and proper. Arguing from firsthand experience, Scottish-born Wilson understood the, quote, discouragement and mortification the foreign-born must feel from the degrading discrimination, end quote. Madison added that a more lengthy citizenship requirement would, quote, discourage the most desirable class of people from emigrating to the United States, end quote. Ultimately, Morris's motion was defeated 
reducing the citizenship requirement to nine years for the Senate. Debates at the convention over citizenship requirements for high political office signaled an even larger disagreement over granting political rights to the foreign born. Delegates like Morris, Elbridge Jerry of Massachusetts and Pierce Butler of South Carolina were united in the concern about the kinds of attachments held by the foreign born. Morris feared that the foreign born, those citizens of the world as he called them, would not be able to shake off their attachments to their own country. Therefore, they could never love any other country, including the United States. On the other hand, Alexander Hamilton, the New York delegate, originally hailing from the British West Indies, directed the convention's attention to those enterprising Europeans who would be attracted to emigrating to the United States by the promise of occupying the same level with the first citizens. In his report on manufacturers to Congress in 1791, Hamilton wrote that foreign manufacturers would be drawn to the United States not only due to the powerful invitations of a better price for their fabrics or their labor, but also for greater personal independence and a greater equality of religious privileges. During the convention proceedings, Madison's lack of suspicion of the foreign born was largely philosophical in nature. He desired to, quote, invite foreigners of merit and Republican principles to the United States. Wilson, on the other hand, pointed to personal experience, to foreign-born delegates already present at the convention, and to the large numbers of foreign officers fighting in the Revolutionary War. He did this to alleviate any fears among the delegates regarding the political attachments of the foreign-born. So in this slide, you can see how the convention delegates line up regarding their positions on citizenship qualifications for high political office and the rights of the foreign-born. So um, I just wanted to sort of lay out the territory there in terms of those who supported sort of a more open um, look at sort of welcoming the foreign born and those who were more restrictive in their positions. Despite the ratification of the Constitution in 1787 and the subsequent addition of the Bill of Rights in 1791, constitutional ambiguity over which level of government properly occupies the field of immigration continues to this day. Specific references to immigration and citizenship are made only four times in the Constitution, three times in Article I and once in Article II. Article I designates Congress as having the sole authority to establish a uniform rule of naturalization, as well as lays out citizenship qualifications for Congress and the Senate. Article II, on the other hand, sets citizenship qualifications for the office of the presidency, declaring that the president must be a natural-born citizen. Apart from these references, additional areas of the Constitution are used in the ongoing debate over which level of government, federal or state government, is responsible for immigration control and enforcement measures. These areas are Article 4, the Tenth Amendment, and the Citizenship Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Indeed, appeal to these references heightened after the passage of Arizona's controversial SB 1070. Following Arizona's lead, Pennsylvania state legislators pointed to the failure of federal action on immigration enforcement by appealing to Article 4 of the Constitution and to the federal responsibility of protecting the states from, quote, invasion and, quote, domestic violence. Citing constitutional ambiguity in the field of immigration, proponents of immigration control and enforcement have made further appeals to the Tenth Amendment and to those powers that are, quote, reserved to the states. Finally, in a further attempt to control immigration flows and rising numbers of citizens sponsoring family members, national political leaders toyed with the idea of amending the Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment in an effort to do away with birthright citizenship. But this effort was to no avail. More recently, some Arizona legislators attempted to craft a bill which would have rejected birthright citizenship in the state. Interestingly, the bill was defeated not on party lines but by a split within the Republican Party. And ironically, the bill was voted down on St. Patrick's Day. And yet there is no ambiguity that candidates for naturalization must profess an attachment to the Constitution in order to become American citizens. This attachment is defined in a threefold manner. First, in a scheduled interview with a United States Citizenship and Immigration Services official, where the candidate must demonstrate good moral character, English proficiency, and a basic knowledge of U.S. history and government. Second, in the taking of a naturalization test during the interview. And third, in the candidate's profession of the oath of allegiance at the naturalization service. As a U.S. 
um, Citizenship and Immigration Service official recently remarked to me, there is really no absolute way to assess whether a candidate's constitutional attachment is genuine. Perhaps this is because the American political tradition has always demanded something more than this, an interior attachment to the reigning laws of the American political order. Krevkor pointed out that the, quote, surprising metamorphosis that had taken place in the New American was due to the invisible power of the laws, those indulgent laws which engraved on newcomers the symbol of adoption. This invisible power of laws was made evident to me as I chatted with my taxi cab driver, Paul, yesterday in Salt Lake City. A refugee from Rwanda, I asked him why he wanted to become an American citizen. This question was of interest to me since the same United States Citizenship and Immigration Service official stated that while thousands of people naturalize each year, officials never question why people choose to naturalize. Paul said, I could talk to you for hours about this, but the first and most important thing I will tell you is that being an American provides an incredible protect protection like nowhere else in the world. Could this Paul from Rwanda be a modern day version of our honest Andrew from the beginning? If so, then the journey and practice of American citizenship need not be an embellished account. If people will continue to come to the United States on account of the laws and industry, as Krevkor reminds us, how will the twin forces of immigration and citizenship continue to shape American political culture going forward? And how should we as native born Americans participate in this journey alongside our immigrant counterparts? A few months ago, I wrote an op-ed for the Public Administration Times, the flagship newspaper for the American Society for Public Administration. In that op-ed, I suggested three ways to bring about the need for what I call a new season of immigration in the United States. So I will outline them here. First, public dialogue and two-way dialogue between native-born and immigrant populations is a must. A larger share of the population must have opportunities to engage the issue of immigration directly by participating in events that expose them to both sides of the issue, immigration reform and control, and allow for deliberation. Let me give one example of nonprofit initiatives taking place in the city of brotherly love. The Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians, an employment and referral center for immigrants serving greater Philadelphia, regularly hosts round tables on economic and demographic trends affecting the region at local community centers and at the public radio station. These forums create opportunities for the general public to realistically consider the challenges municipalities face regarding their immigrant populations. Also, they provide examples of immigrant contributions at the local level. Second, the new season of immigration must showcase immigrant integration efforts on the part of local public officials. Public managers are well aware that integrating diverse populations is the greatest challenge for public administration in years to come. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 12 percent of the total U.S. population was foreign born and an additional 11 percent were second generation immigrants. Moreover, roughly 20 percent of U.S. residents and 10 percent of Philadelphia residents speak a language other than English at home. For public administrators, integration is an all-encompassing term, including language access policies, English language instruction, economic mobility, social and cultural interaction, and civic participation. Mention has already been made about the establishment of a language access policy under the administration of Mayor Michael Nutter in Philadelphia. Simply focusing on the state level policies misses the broader landscape of efforts taking place in municipalities all across the country. Given the demographic trends of new immigrant gateways, monitoring the success of these efforts at the local level will be critical going forward. Finally, in this, this new season demands an appeal to the historical record. After following both sides of the immigration debate in Philadelphia from 2009 to 2010 as a researcher, I have come to appreciate starting the discussion on immigration where the Constitution does at the Constitutional Convention. How can we carefully wade back into that larger debate about the role of the foreign born? For one, self-proclaimed progressives must learn to appreciate more the principles of the American founding, and self-proclaimed conservatives must be willing to delve more deeply into them. We must unite our attention to present-day situations with a better grasp of how immigrants have featured in the American political experiment. 
This demands more time spent on our part, fostering historical knowledge and coming to terms with America's equally embracing and restrictive history of immigration throughout the decades. So in answer to the questions posed in the introduction, is the view that America is both a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants compatible? I think that the answer is yes. But as a nation, we have yet to figure out the best balance between these two pillars of American political identity. One of the central benefits resulting from the growing diversification of the immigrant landscape in the United States is that immigration politics is no longer an issue reserved for some regions. It is an issue at the heart of both American politics and American public administration and no longer can be set apart or sidelined. Furthermore, should the notions of citizenship and immigration be studied in an interconnected fashion or as separate items for analysis? Since new immigration flows continue to replenish the meaning of American citizenship, it would be impossible to extricate one term fully from the other. Indeed, there is a symbiotic relationship between the two. Finally, what are we to make of the fact that Americans privilege the term citizen over that of patriot? Here I would just end by stating that notions of citizenship are at the forefront of American immigration policy and that the content of these notions contribute to the continual fashioning of American political culture. Through the naturalization process, candidates become not patriots, but American citizens after all. And these last slides depict the recent settlement of Cambodian Buddhist monks in South Philadelphia. They came to serve their native Cambodians in a spiritual manner, fashioning their temple along the model of the famous Angkor Wat. What's intriguing about this picture is that amidst the wearing of their resplendent orange and crimson robes and their own physical construction of the temple, a pickup truck is parked in the temple's courtyard with the license reading, the USA is still number one. Thank you for your time.